But uh, yeah, I'm curious, like what uh, what's been on your mind, and like what are you excited, like what topics? Uh, in, in oh, lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but I'll just give you one or two random examples out of yeah. the science stuff that we do. So, uh, so one thing I've I've been interested in for a long time, which wasn't again our specialty at all, but we I sort of got into it over the last few years, is the quantum measurement problem. Mm. So this is a big problem in quantum mechanics, uh, where basically uh, there's something called the Born postulate that says that if a system is in a certain state. Uh, then the, when you do a measurement on it, there can be multiple outcomes for that measurement uh, that are given by basically overlapping that state with what's called eigenstates of that, right. that measurement. And then you square that and that tells you what the probability is. Mm -hmm. But so all you get is a probability of a measurement, right? And so uh, this is very different from our classical experience where if, if I do the measurement, I actually get an answer right? Right. And, and I get like a specific an answer. It may be different, it may be a different answer every time, but it is a specific answer every time. So quantum mechanics in that sense tells us about what we expect when you do a series of measurements. And, and you certainly then expect that those averages will follow you know, what that uh, Born postulate says. But it doesn't really enlighten us on what like a specific uh, measurement uh, does. And so uh, a few years ago, I had this eureka moment where I finally thought, now I understand this, uh, even though there are people like Feynman who claim that like nobody will ever understand quantum measurement. And uh, I think our solution to this problem is actually that uh, uh, many body localization is a phenomenon that occurs in the Schrodinger equation, which is the main equation in quantum mechanics, um, uh, when you have large disordered systems. And when you're doing a measurement, that's what you really do. You have like a small system that you're measuring, and then you have a large system that you call the detector, right? That's doing the measurement. And I think what we've concluded is actually that quantum localization um, with just running the Schrodinger equation actually can lead to uh, measurement processes. Or another way of saying it is that even though the Schrodinger equation is a unitary equation and measurement looks like a non-unitary problem, that's really the, you know, how do you get these two things together? It turns out actually any kind of subsystem that you're looking at you know, in, its, in its dynamics uh, actually has that non-linearity coming out of it as an emergent phenomenon, even though the Schrodinger equation is a linear equation. And we think that solves the problem. And we've actually run computer simulations on this. Um, where we prepare some system like a photon that could be going to the left or to the right with probability of 60% one way, 40% the other way. And we run these simulations, letting it interact with large detector-like systems. And indeed, what it does is the energy goes one way 60% of the time and 40% the other way. Them. But it actually goes one way or the other. So any individual measurement mm. actually satisfies the Born postulate. Um, and, but you do get the correct statistics, and this is purely just from running Schrodinger dynamics. But the key is you have to run it in very large dimensional systems that can give you what's called many body or quantum localization. So that's one thing that we're interested in. Uh, something at the totally opposite end of the spectrum is um, we got interested in how proteins interact with one another. And you know, people used to assume 50 years ago that cells are kind of just like bags of fluid and that everything in them, proteins, whatever, is just yeah. kind of a jumble that's sort of moving around. But you know, there's a lot more structure than that to cells. And in fact, there are uh, these uh, things called metabolons or, or these very loosely bound protein complexes where proteins don't really stick to each other really well. They just kind of, you know, court one another sort of a little mm -hmm. bit. Right? Uh, but that's actually already enough, for instance, to enhance reaction rates because, you know, if some protein makes something, an enzyme, then it doesn't need to go very far to get to the next enzyme to do another step in the reaction. And so we study these things and, and uh, years back I... Uh, was uh, at a place in Germany, in the, the Max Planck Institute for Medicine in Heidelberg, and I, they opened this room to me that was like dark blue light only, and there were thousands of aquaria lining the walls um, that were filled with zebrafish, like disappearing in the dark shadows in the horizon. It was kind of like, again, this is a movie that many people nowadays maybe have, haven't watched anymore, but there's a scene at the end of Indiana Jones, you know, the original Raiders of the Lost Ark, where the Ark has been handed over to the U.S. government and it is in a wooden box among millions of wooden boxes in a gigantic hangar and you'll never find it again, right, kind of thing. Um, so this is what that room looked like to me. And I said, this is cool. I need to do experiments with zebrafish. I don't care what the experiment is. <laughs> I need to do an experiment with zebrafish. And so a few years later, uh, the opportunity arose. So we actually set up a colleague of mine, Jan Schemler in physics, and I set up a, a lab in, uh, where we grow zebrafish. And uh, we learned how to husband them. And, you know, there's all kinds of things. You need to keep the animals alive. And there's regulations and whatever, you know, uh, for animals. And, and so we figured all this out. Again, lots of mistakes. And, but again, after a few years, we kind of knew what we were doing. And so now we can actually do these experiments. where We can put these animals under a, a microscope. 
and we can use uh, genetic manipulation to change the, to make it a genetically engineered animal, but instead of the entire animal being genetically changed, only a few cells in the animal are genetically changed. And we can express the protein that we want to look at. It's dynamic, like how does it talk to other proteins just in that cell and then have it light up through fluorescence. And so you can stick this animal under the microscope and you'll find there's like one cell <laughs> over there that you can zoom in on. And then you can see how that protein behaves inside that cell. And then you, and like maybe it's a nerve cell. And then you go, go to another one uh, and genetically engineer it so that it does it with a skin cell or a muscle cell. Mm. And so we can actually look at individual tissue types. Whereas if you made the entire animal glow, I mean, you've seen these things on the news where they make like whatever animal glow green nowadays, right? right? So that wouldn't have worked for us because then everything would glow and you wouldn't be able to tell like, a muscle from a, yeah, and we needed to isolate it. And so we figured out an alternative way of doing this where rather than the whole fish glowing green, we can just make like one cell mm. in the fish uh, uh, glow green. So that's kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum because one end of the spectrum is sort of biology experiments and the other end of the spectrum is like computational physicists, you know, you know writing software, you know, to do quantum simulations. Maybe think about how they're both connected to each other. Oh, they're only connected, I, as far as I know, you know by the fact that uh, I found them both interesting. In, in one case, because it's just a problem that you get stuck with, right, when you do quantum mechanics eventually, like, you know, why is it like that? And the other one, as I said, because I walked into a dimly lit blue room that had like aquaria, thousands of them disappearing in the, you know, fading in the back of the room. It's like, that was too cool. I need to do that. <laughs> so, you know, the reasons can be very different you know, uh, for why you end up doing something. I mean, sometimes it's more directed because you know really something about it. And sometimes it's just silly, like, this is cool. I want like a blue room with fish as well. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's how it started. But then usually it gets serious after a while, right? Once you figure out what you can do with it.